have to be really mature to be able to survive in, in the submarine fleet. It's really an elite force, and I felt like I wanted to be a part of that. Somewhere, hundreds of feet below the Eastern Pacific, the crew of the USS Topeka is being called away to battle stations after picking up a contact on their sonar. They will maneuver into position to fire a torpedo. Submariners always operate as though they're actually at war. From Commander Jablonski to the most junior enlisted man, they are here by choice. Their training is as rigorous as any in the armed forces. It begins right after boot camp. Morning, gentlemen. Rise and shine. Let's go. Roll out. 5.30 in the morning. Let's go. Wake Sleeping Beauty up down there. Body awake. Let's go. Wake your shipmates up. Aged between 17 and 25, these young men are beginning an intensive six-week course. At the end of it, if they pass the weekly test, they could find themselves at the controls of a billion-dollar nuclear submarine. Mom, no hands. <laughs> Look, Mom, no brains. Across the world, another submarine goes to action stations. You are A Russian typhoon is preparing to dive. Taking the world's largest submarine beneath the water requires immense precision and teamwork. 20 years ago, Captain Zhigulyov started his training at the Zherzinsky College of Naval Engineering. <laughs> In Russia, two years military training is still compulsory, but you can select the service in which you'll train. Many choose submarines from a sense of family tradition, but some of the 2,000 trainees here will join the surface fleet. Russia has a proud naval tradition dating from the time of Peter the Great, who commissioned an experimental submarine in 1719. Here in St. Petersburg, he laid the foundation for what was to become the largest submarine force in the world. The school in which these cadets train is located in the old Admiralty, built by Peter nearly 300 years ago. In the course of the Cold War, nuclear submarines became one of the principal pillars of Soviet strategic doctrine. But the diesel electrics which fought their campaigns in both world wars still form a major part of their fleet. These museum pieces are not far removed from submarines on which some of these trainees will serve. While the U.S. force is religiously nuclear, its submarines designed to hunt for or hide from the Russians, Soviet interests have included confined waterways more suited to the capabilities of diesel boats like this Foxtrot. At 10 submarine academies across the former Soviet Union, courses are conducted in both technologies, they are hard to get into, easy to fail, and the demands are intense. As well as becoming familiar with reactor rooms, control rooms, and communication centers, the trainee will have his nerve tested in simulators. These students are practicing how to plunge their boat into a crash dive. 
It may look antiquated, but the trainee's response to such an emergency must become second nature for the day when they face the real thing. For the trainee, the principles of submerging and surfacing apply as much to the Foxtrot as to the 24,000-ton typhoon. But there, the similarity ends. Learning to drive this submersible mountain is only part of the story. When your boat contains unimaginable explosive power, as well as a couple of nuclear reactors the size of a bus, safety is everything. <laughs> The most dangerous thing is unprofessionalism and a lack of expertise among the crew. It only takes one person, one person on the boat who is an amateur, and the situation is fraught with dire consequences. A submarine is not simply a hollow cylinder. It is divided into various compartments, like the engineering and propulsion plant, weapon spaces, the control center, and living quarters. Each must be capable of being sealed off because each is vulnerable to two major threats. The two great fears of submariners are, of course, fire and flood. Fire because you're in an enclosed space and even a smoldering rag can fill a compartment with smoke within a matter of moments. And, of course, you can't get rid of that smoke. You can contain it, but you can't get rid of it unless you get up to the surface and, and ventilate the compartment out. So far is, is, the real, is, is the really serious threat. Flooding, well, the noise of running water, one of the first things you're trained on training classes, you always run towards the sound of running water. Each time they perform this basic drill, the water will get deeper and colder until finally they can stop the leak even in the dark. But at operating depths, the ocean would enter with the force of a steel rod, smashing anything in its path. You can become concerned over a long submarine career, and I think most people do at some stage, as you settle into your bed at night, uh, nestling alongside the pressure hull, and one inch away from you, of course, is uh, a thousand feet pressure of water. <laughs> Well, I think they need to set tougher conditions because the exercise is simple to perform. It's relevant only to shallow depths. You couldn't do this to save your ship at great depths. But the exercise is good for getting over that psychological barrier. It is mental training. These cadets are about to face a simulated engine room fire. They must isolate and control it as quickly as possible, for even a short delay could jeopardize lives and possibly the ship. It's a straightforward, almost routine exercise, but it holds particular relevance for the Russians. They have lost sailors and nuclear submarines to fires, some very recently. The Russian submarine, the Mike class, the Konsomolets, which sunk in the Norwegian Sea a couple of years ago, was destroyed by fire. 
and the Yankee-class strategic submarine that sank off Bermuda, almost certainly, again, it was fire that got out of control. Norwegian defense forces were tracking and photographing the Soviet submarine before the fire and before it went down. So I think there is a question mark over the Soviet firefighting capability as it has been demonstrated in the last five years. We believe, based on the Soviet Mike submarine sinking, part of their problem was the fact that the crew got exhausted before they could solve the damage control problems they were faced with, and they ultimately lost the ship. Aware of the potentially catastrophic results of such emergencies, all nuclear navies reject criticism of their safety standards. The Titanic was the unsinkable ship, but it sunk. Things do go wrong. Accidents have happened. The Americans have lost two nuclear power submarines at sea. The Soviets have lost possibly up to seven nuclear power submarines at sea. The last one being a couple of years ago, the Mike class off of Norway. These fifth year cadets face the immediate prospect of service in a military with a poor record of nuclear safety. Though information has been scarce, senior officers admit that there are problems. It is not surprising that accidents occur on board American ships and on board Soviet ships, and they are related in the first instance to the fact that the level of training lags behind the adaptation to new technology. Nuclear accidents on board submarines, like the one described in this film, are bad enough. But 40 years of nuclear power have produced a deadly legacy. So what's happening in the Soviet Union is that these Soviet submarines are just stockpiling up. When you go to the big ports like Serodinsk, Seramorsk, you find that there are defunct submarines just laying there. No one knows what to do with them. With more to decommission than anyone else, the Russians have the biggest problem, but they're not alone. None of the nuclear navies knows how to dispose of a worn out nuclear submarine. The sensible, rational, scientific solution would be to take it out into deep water and sink it. It would then give off less radiation than the average granite outcrop uh, in places, for instance, like Aberdeen in Scotland. What you put in the ocean today stays there. You can't take a vacuum cleaner to the ocean and clean up the mess in 10 years' time because you found out new information about the radiation dose effects. These recruits follow in the footsteps of 6,000 submarine engineers who've trained here in Pushkin. And in Groton, 50 new recruits start training every week. First thing I want to do is welcome you to the submarine force. If you're wondering and asking yourself, am I where I belong? The answer is yes. You're going to get the best training the Navy has to offer in the submarine force. No BS. They say you've got to have four eggs, but I don't know. This is base is called the heart of the submarine force, and it is. I know that might sound a little corny, but it is. I mean, every submariner starts here and he will at some time be back here. Submariners have been training at Groton since 1916. The most complex, the most compact, the most deadly ship of war, ton for ton, ever conceived by man as the submarine. No training is more rigid, no training more intense than that of the submariner, who must fight his battles imprisoned in a carcass of steel, sailing in the deeps of the world's water basins. The purpose of this school is to screen you guys. We're going to do that several ways. We're going to look at you academically. We're going to look at you environmentally. And we're going to look at you militarily. I've been telling you this since last week. I'm not listening to it anymore. I'm not going to listen to myself talk. If somebody's got a stencil kit here, share it, use it. We want them to start taking responsibility for themselves because a lot of them 
it's their first time away from home. Uh, Mama's not here to lay out their clothes for them in the morning and stuff anymore. You look good. Thank you, Chief. The classes load them with information, all of which they must retain to graduate. It's a crash course, and only the motivated survive. We've got this thing called a cord. It's a muffler. Being able to pack all this information, they throw a lot of stuff at us in this short period of time, and they make us learn it all. All right, how many people in here want to go to an SSBN? That is your first choice of duty, SSBN. Put your hands up. But they can choose what kind of submarine they want to serve on. Some choose an SSN, the Fast Attack or Hunter Killer Submarine. Its varied missions, including stalking other submarines and covert operations, seem to promise adventure. Others prefer the SSBN, the Strategic Ballistic Missile Submarine, the floating hotel with its regular routine of deterrent patrols. This class of submarine is almost constantly at sea, manned by alternating crews. Take the watch. Emergency blow, emergency sir. Whichever submarine they choose, the trainees must learn to drive it, to turn thousands of tons around within four times its length, and to ascend and descend at a rate of several hundred feet per minute. They learn on a simulator they call dive and drive. I'm really nervous about this now. I've never done this before. I, I did it once, but real life you watch out because sometimes you lose the indications sometimes you may only lose one of the indications make sure you call what it is you need That's to let us know that there's a problem first yeah talk let people know get the word out right and every casualty get the word every out casualty. their storm planes are stuck or jammed on full dive or 25 dive okay what are you going to say serious planes jammed at 15 degree dive now do you think they heard you back there did no. you guys hear that what did no. you say no. didn't hear that no. serious planes jammed at 15 degree dive Okay, that's a little better, okay? Manly and commanding, that's the key here. Your first couple times, you're very nervous, especially if you're the man in charge and stuff, but after a while, you get used to it. And that's how you survive, though. You're, if you have a casualty, you need to be ready to handle it, and you're gonna fight a casualty the way you train to fight a casualty. You're not gonna do it correctly if you've never practiced. So, submarining is stressful. Do you understand the bubble? What is, the, what is it showing you right now? This? What, what angle is the ship at? It's not a perfect trim. Oh, you got that right. What's the number? What degrees of dive do we have on right now, bubble on a ship? Five. No. First time I was doing it, I was trying to concentrate so much on actually maintaining control and things like that. And then midway through the training simulation, I just said, hey, might as well enjoy it now. This is the best it's going to get. Diving officer, submerge the ship to 150 feet. Dive, dive. It's been said that American submarines are overmanned and underautomated. In theory, that may be true until something goes wrong under 50 feet of Arctic ice. That are stressful. We got a building that simulates part of the engine room. We're going to set it on fire, and you guys put it out. You guys, not John Wayne, not Chuck Norris. You guys. Perpendicular to the hose. Bring your hand around, down and under. Put it on the outside of your shoulder. There you go. When something goes wrong, you need people who can figure it out very quickly, take the appropriate action, and maybe combat the casualty for long periods of time. Also on week five, we're going to send you what we call the wet trainer. Its technical name is the damage control trainer. We just call it the wet trainer because you're going to get wet. Obviously, this it simulates here, part of the engine room on a submarine. Lower level this time, not upper level. And facing forward. It's full of pipes, valves, pumps, motors. 
the instructor, he has it nice. He sits in a little glass booth. He stays nice and dry. He flips switches, and all the water in the world starts coming into that trainer. You all heard the horror stories about the flange. It's located, it's got a three quarter inch gap in between the two faces. It's a metal to metal surface. Your job is to actually tighten up the bolts, bringing the two surfaces together. If you were on a submarine and there's no switch thrown then, but the water starts coming in, it is all the water in the world. It's the ocean. 1,200 gallons per minute. It's the largest leak that you'll be facing in here. You guys don't stop it, it gets deep. If you're a short guy, you're going to be real interested in getting it stopped quicker than the tall guys will. Fighting a casualty is no place for individual heroics. Teamwork is the key. The instructor monitors the exercise, communicating with the team leader through an airphone. How many personnel are in the space? How many personnel are in engine room lower level? Uh, wait one. Wait, I? Where are you going? Get out of there. There's one guy up there on this side standing and holding right. right. You, that's Go always up there. Going. These men might be enjoying this spectacle now, but it's their turn next. Oh my God. The pressure is relentlessly increased. Go ahead and give me the ASW discharge flange. We want to see if they're physically and mentally capable of handling a stressful situation that we put them in with just the water spraying around everywhere and see if they can actually handle it, be able to work in that kind of environment. If they have a problem working in the water, well then we need to know about it because if they go onto a submarine and they get faced with this situation, uh, it could be detrimental to themselves and personnel around them. These exercises test psychological suitability more than practical skills. They will come later. The real training starts for them when they get on their boat. The guy's really going to learn the nuts and bolts of the system, be able to touch the valves, trace the pipe, look at the breakers, see his gear, work on his gear when he gets to the submarine. Petty Officer Torkelson, Petty Officer Whipple, Mostadler, front and center. And salute. Ready, two. All of these men have achieved the award about to be presented to their shipmates, their dolphins. Silver for the enlisted men and gold for the officers. They're like a pilot's wings and just as hard to earn. To qualify, the raw submariner must learn every major system on board, be able to describe how it works, draw it, and recite its specifications. All this on a boat with seven million parts. It marks the coming of age of a submariner and the end of a tough first year on board. In all submarine fleets, junior officers aspire to one thing above all others, to captain their own submarine. It remains one of the most challenging of commands. If there's one thing that we've learned, and I think that the United States Navy has learned as well, a submarine commanding officer cannot have a rule book. OK, sure, there are some things which he can't do and some things which he must do, but he can't have a rule book. There, there is no set tactic or set thing to do in such and such a circumstance. He must use his own initiative and adapt, and adapt very quickly in split seconds to what's happening. 
At first, the Royal Navy did not believe it necessary to train its submarine captains. A good eye for shooting partridge was considered qualification enough. This is the submarine command team trainer, where basically um, the submarine officers come in here to learn the basic skills of being a submarine officer. Operators collect information from many sensors, keeping the captain informed. Piecing the picture together enables him to make the tactical decisions in fighting the submarine. Very similar to um, a medieval knight on a hill. The captain can sit there, he can look over the top of these young men, and they will get all that information and, like a jigsaw, put all the bits in. But for a true sense of the pressure involved, there's nothing like the real thing. 30 miles outside of Glasgow, a Royal Naval frigate is charging straight towards a Royal Naval submarine. This man wants to captain a submarine. This man must decide whether he's capable of doing so. Look at the ball for two minutes. A British commanding okay, officer okay, is trained in what's known as the perisher course. A perisher derives from an old expression, periscope school. But as a matter of fact, it's not such a bad expression because a lot of people perish along the way. Come oh, on, get me up and down. Come on, engineer, there's some speed. It's an utterly ruthless preparation for command, totally ruthless. Uh, and being British, we're more used to people being rude to us, very rude to us, than I think people are in the United States Navy as a whole. Come on, engineer. Come on, sir. Engineer, you're going to go and put up your ass if you don't get this boat on depth. Very, very brutal. A lot of people fail. But at the end of it, you come out tough and able to face any tactical situation on your own, without support, and take full responsibility for it. I'm not saying that's not true of United States Naval officers as well, but it's my opinion that they were more inclined, certainly in the early days of nuclear power, to look back aft at that big kettle boiling up back there than they were to look forward to their torpedo tubes and the enemy ahead. Submarine captains can polish their skills in the calmer atmosphere of the attack teacher. Computer scenarios simulate potential do-or-die situations. All stack taker deep, look back up clear to the right. Tom, all heads two-thirds. Head two-thirds, Tom, Sounding, one five zero fathom below the keel. Check the chart. No, right, 10 degrees rudder. Listen up in the fire control party. Just received uh, flash traffic due to the deteriorating uh, political situation in the Orange Republic and their perception of our disarmament. The uh, Orange Republic has uh, launched attack against the United States. A hot war exists. We're open ocean. Received uh, traffic indicating an orange submarine is entering our area from the west. We've received orders to uh, prosecute and uh, attack any enemy forces in our area. Any questions? Carry on. The Navy has this idea and policy and tradition of true accountability, 100% accountability to the captain of a ship. He is responsible for the way the garbage is dumped all the way up to the way the torpedo is shot or the guns are shot. Annapolis is the premier officer training academy for the U.S. Navy. The courses are heavy in nuclear science, but some say too light in humanities and the art of war. Next, you see the 41st and last of the Polaris submarines. Uh, I'm a little bit biased toward this submarine myself because, frankly, I was the first skipper of it. In their final this year, the, the midshipmen are addressed by senior officers. It's a recruitment exercise. Their example might inspire the fledgling officers to share their passion. Following that, in the motif of any place, any time, 
Here's a USS Archer fish. In Given Lama some qualities that I would look for is first, you gotta know your job. You gotta know your stuff. You gotta know your weapons. You gotta know your ship. We have a uh, very small bearing rate indicating that the contact is either distant or that we're on a lead, possible overlead line of sight. Range 10 to 12,000 yards. Carry on. Stand by to mark minute, three, two. The good skippers I had when I was young allowed me to make torpedo approaches, to make landings when only skippers were making landings. And when you're going in with a current either against you or with you, and you've got to kind of shoot the thing on the fly. Well, sometimes you hit the pier pretty hard. Sometimes the pier almost goes over. Some people have hit their own automobile at the head of the pier. Uh, but these are things that really give you great confidence. Uh, in, in, when you're the person doing it. Well, oh, I'm steady course, three, four, five. Steady course, three, four, five. I'm going to be close 2,000 yards. I work two, five, six, point six. Copy one. Under the captain's eye, the team maneuvers into the best position to fire. Here's the best solution from prime mate. There are certain things that you have to be vitally interested in and involved in, and uh, one of them is safe navigation of the ship. You must not run aground. The other one is safe navigation is, pertains to hitting another ship. You will not have a collision. Either one of those can ruin your whole day, not to mention a career. As well as technical training, there are other vital qualities, less tangible, but still essential for successful command. The attributes of leadership that I think are essential combine management competence with enough charisma that one can inspire people to follow. The responsibility of commanding a submarine is rather unique. Uh, best described in short, terms as run silent, run deep. One is totally alone, uh, far less subject to the kind of minute-by-minute you know, -minute guidance that a surface commander is likely to be in a task force, uh, particularly when one commands a ballistic missile submarine with the awesome responsibility of uh, not only ensuring that there is never an accident or never an accidental launch, but that the um, machine is in instant readiness to fire when directed uh, requires a tremendous attention to detail, a tremendous sense of teamsmanship. Get on my back. <laughs> Lie flat on me, put your feet on my feet. Don't kiss me on the ear. Even at 70 years of age, you can still have the right stuff. All right, you ready? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there are some old adages that some people print up and put around, like know your stuff, be a man, take care of your men. And that's not too bad. I mean, you've got to take care of your crew, you've got to know your crew, you've got to be human, and you've got to be able to laugh at your mistakes, because you're going to make them. All your people are going to make them, and you may make the most colossal ones. So if you've been smiling at them, maybe you can laugh at yourself a little bit. Well, it gives you something to work on. OK. So you got firing solution? I have firing solution. Very well. Firing point procedures, Sierra 2, tube 3, single fire ad cap. The climax of the hunt, but the atmosphere in the control center remains low key and disciplined. Solution ready. Solution ready. Shoot on generated bearing. Set. Stand by. Fire. Torpedo course, 132. Runs enabled. 6,000 yards. Just make that phone shift here and run it. Very well, running normally. Shot looks good. 2,000 yards to torpedo enabled. Yeah. Bearing 125, range 900 yards. Target is going 110, speed 10 knots. 125.1. Terminal homing. 
Loud explosion on the bearing of uh, Sierra One. We got our quarry. We'll uh, open down them and uh, look out uh, for any uh, companions. Oh, this was a very successful attack. We um, acquired the contact. The target did not counter detect us. We controlled the tactical situation throughout. We obtained an optimum firing position where we could attack him with uh, impunity. Uh, we were at the perfect weapons range, perfect solution. Uh, we probably wasted too much time making the solution too good. The uh, torpedo uh, functioned properly, acquired the uh, contact when it should have, and uh, exploded. We're just waiting for the breaking up noises. Torpedoes are not the only weapons a hunter-killer captain trains to fire, as was demonstrated during Desert Storm. No U.S. submarine had fired in combat since World War II. I'm speaking to you next to one of the Tomahawk vertical launch hatches forward on the ship, out of which came the Tomahawk, which on the 19th of January, 1991, was fired by this ship to an unidentified Iraqi target. The use of cruise missiles by the Louisville expanded the submarine's role into the realm of strike warfare. Its crew received a triumphant homecoming. And we were greeted by a special edition Louisville Slugger back. It says Louisville Slugger, the ship's hull number, SSN 724. And over here in the periscope crosshairs, kicked Saddam's butt January 19th, 1991. The prime responsibility of command is the nuclear reactor, according to its high priest, Admiral Rickover. But a submarine's purpose involves more than just intimate knowledge of its propulsion. Admiral Rickover made a big point of you can't get there if the power plant doesn't get you there, and that's right. But the name of the game is being able to fight a war, to win a battle. And you've got to develop your tactics. We have chosen in the Royal Navy to continue focusing on tactics, what you do with a sharp end, and to let an extremely well-trained specialist, a technical guy, to look after the kettle back aft. We run things a bit differently from the British, for example, where uh, the officers in the Royal Navy uh, are engineering specialists or operational tactics specialists, and uh, uh, we are trained uh, to be good at both ends. It doesn't mean to say that our commanding officers know nothing about nuclear power. They know a very, very great deal about it. Indeed, they do. But they don't feel that they have to be technical to the degree that a United States naval officer feels he has to be, indeed has to be, under the regime which Admiral Rickover started. If you're on your way to a nuclear engineering exam, tradition claims this will bring you luck. Such is the Admiral's legacy. But whether propulsion or tactics are more important in nuclear submarine warfare has only been tested once. Having attacked, um, well, normally in the attack teacher, we'd all stop and have a cup of tea and a smoke or something, but uh, it wasn't quite like that at sea. The only submarine commander to have sunk a warship with a nuclear submarine is this man. During the actual attack, it was very much like countless other ones I'd done for practice before, both at sea on live targets and indeed um, in, in our attack teacher. HMS Conqueror was sent to the Falklands in April 1982. The British were reacting to an invasion of their territory by Argentina. In what was to become the most controversial incident of the brief war, Reeford Brown quickly made sonar contact with a group of Argentinian warships. I entered my patrol area to the southwest of Falkland Islands on the evening of the 30th of the April. And having settled down to patrol, I quite rapidly uh, gained detection on one of my sonars. The General Belgrano was an aging cruiser with more than a thousand men aboard. Much was to be made of her movements immediately prior to the attack. 
We spent the whole of that night just fo just following them from deep, which is not particularly difficult for an SSN. Sending uh, location reports back, I think about every six hours or so. The British had declared a total exclusion zone, but the Belgrano was outside it and could not be attacked. So Reford Brown followed her and waited for instructions. I had quite a lot of time to, in my cabin to actually think how I was going to conduct the attack. I mean, I, I, I felt in my own mind that at some stage, uh, Northwood, our, our command back here, would actually instruct me to, to carry out the attack. And I, I, I chose which torpedo I was going to use. I also, in my own mind, worked out where I was going to position myself. So there was uh, some mental preparation. After trailing the Belgrano for more than 25 hours, the Conqueror received new orders from Whitehall. Sink it. I was some seven miles astern of them, and it took me about two hours to catch them up and work into an attacking position. I'd selected the Mark 8 torpedo to fire, and I planned to fire a salvo of three of those to counteract for any, area, any errors that uh, I made in the fire control solution. I worked myself into a position of, well, when we fi eventually fired, I was about 1,400 yards on the port bow of, of the cruiser. Um, gave, gave the order to fire. We heard the torpedoes run on our underwater sonar. Could hear them quite distinctly running out, and indeed heard one and then another hit. I was looking through the periscope at the time and saw a distinct cloud of smoke and flame from the first one, and then I think I saw another cloud of smoke from the second. A cheer went up in the control room, I think, when we, when we heard the hit, the hit and I, I looked around and saw actually there was a lot more people in every corner than one perhaps anticipated at, uh, at attack stations. After that, uh, we, I went deep and uh, moved away to the, to the east to uh, just get out of the general area because I wasn't quite sure what the two destroyers were going to do, whether they're going to come and take an interest in me and try and counterattack. The Conqueror returned home to fierce debate over the decision to sink the Belgrano, echoing an earlier era when submarines were regarded as underhand and immoral. She uh, was a threat to the task force. She'd been steaming towards them, and I'd been watching her for a few hours beforehand, and uh, under direct orders, I went in and attacked her. Was I think you? by doing so, um, although there was obviously loss of life on her, which I regret, I certainly saved considerable loss of life from the British task force. I'd I was, was obviously aware that I'd actually killed I don't know how many and didn't know for a long time, but quite, quite a few people. So there was a certain sense of concern that that, that had happened. N nevertheless, as far as I was concerned, as far as the ship's company was concerned, we were at war. My immediate reactions after that was, I think the first one was one of relief that I'd actually achieved something that the ship's company and I had been trained to do over a number of, number of years, all of us, and a sense of um, exhilaration that I'd actually achieved it. Once upon a time, to be in submarines marked you as inferior, an undersea pirate. But over a hundred years of submarine warfare have created a community which now regards itself as an elite. The recruits in Groton and St. Petersburg will become part of this tradition. inherited from our submariners, specifically our World War II submariners, a, a mindset, a way of life, a commitment that is unmatched anywhere in the world. I mean, you have 
feeling for these guys. I mean, it's, it's like your family. I'm not going to lie. There's probably a lot of submariners out there that are going to watch this and say that, oh, that's BS. But I mean, it really isn't. I mean, you can ask them. I wouldn't trade any memories I have on this thing or any of my friends I have on this thing for anything in the world. They're good. They're good people. the enemy is no longer as clearly defined, and where moves toward disarmament will continue to reduce the submarine's importance. Their prohibitive cost is becoming harder to justify. Yet should a new world conflict arise, it will be in the hands of young men like these. For now, more than ever, such a war is likely to be won and lost under the sea.